Hi, my brothers and sisters, it's Josh Packard. Hey, today I want to talk about the book of Revelation and, and the eyes through which we can see the Lord correctly. See, Jesus never changes, um, ever. He never has. But as we grow, um, we change, and we, we come closer to Christ, and we perceive him differently. And uh, a lot of people say, well, that's dangerous, Josh, to, to think that. Well, follow me out real quick. Follow and hear what I have to say. Um, and see if this is true with you. Okay, when you first are walking and you don't know Christ, you're an enemy to him. And so when you read the scriptures, you're not gonna, you're, you're gonna see him coming. Let's, let's see it this way. Just think about it personally, interpersonally, that this big badass um, God that is the ruler of all of creation is, you know, is your enemy. And so when you see him coming, you're gonna genuinely, you're gonna kind of cower away from him because you don't want to mess with him because he's your enemy. And as you as you transition from being a non-believer to actually beginning to believe, you're going to see, oh well, you know, he loves me and you know, and he's my king, he's my lord. And so whenever you see him coming, you you might wave or bow to him. You know, you might do a reverential bow and but you won't you won't want to get close to him. Um, but the as you get closer, you'll have these these guys that grew up with them and went to battle with them and they they've they spent a lot of times together and they've they've been in the mix well when jesus comes you'll come up to him embrace him and you you'll you'll hug him and say oh man it's good to see you again you know you're, you have a real little bit more intimacy but his son you know his son has even more intimacy he just takes the intimacy for granted he goes and sits on his daddy's lap and farts on his leg you know, he's just totally unceremonious at all. He's, you know, he's just so close with his dad. And he, you know, helps himself to the refrigerator, jumps on the horse whenever he wants. Just, he doesn't even know it. And he's, he's still, he's so much closer. But the bride, the bride is someone who shares everything with him. He shares his innermost secrets with. You know his heart. You share his bed. You're, you're, he's like, every moment you have this intimacy where you walk hand in hand. And you share everything together, and 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 as as you as you come to becoming a bride, and as you see him that closely, and you know, and I'm I'm going to tell you right now, it's still mostly in my head. I get it in my head. But it's it's a hard step to have that intimacy in your your heart because it has to come a revelation, but or illumination, as Bill would say. And, uh, but the thing is, is as you, each one of these positions, as you see God, it shades the way that you understand scripture. Because when you see mentions of hell, when you're an enemy, you're going, oh my God, I'm going to go to hell. What kind of just God would throw me into hell? But as you become closer, you start seeing that this is what he rescued you from, that you have full deserve. You deserve it. You deserve going there. You deserve that punishment. All of us do. But, but Christ took that punishment on, on himself. And why? And it was to get you to the place to where you would come further with him. But most Christians are still just in that place to where they're like, oh, holy, holy, Jesus, Jesus, oh, you're so amazing. And, and nobody's going forward to going, oh, Jesus. Oh. Look at like John when he was cuddling with him at the Last Supper. Like a grown man you know, was, was reclining on Jesus' breast. What kind of man would Jesus have been where people felt that comfortable with him? But it, I mean, I'm, I'm sure John wasn't that way right at first. And this is how you kind of got to look at scriptures. As you get closer to Jesus, the scriptures are going to change. They're going to go, oh my God, Jesus loves me. Oh my God, we, he wants to have fellowship with me. He wants me to get up off my knees and on my feet. He wants me to come into his presence. He wants me to help myself to a soda and, and you know, go through the kingdom on his horse whenever I want. He wants me to come and share everything with him. He doesn't want me bowing down at his feet and groveling. He wants to have relationship and intimacy with us because that's the purpose of love. That's what love genuinely wants. The, the idea that people have of Jesus about this king and God, and that's true, but but it, you're not, if he's off in that distance, 
you're 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 not honoring him. You're not coming. Think of Adam and Eve in the garden, and they were naked and unashamed, and they were just chilling with God. There wasn't like this big idea that he's oh, oh God and bow down. It's no, they were they were intimate with him. They chatted with him. They were, you know, they were comfortable enough to lie to his face. I mean, just to kind of you know get this in perspective. So when you read books like Revelation and you see how much Jesus loves you and what his desire is, and you understand it, when you read the scripture, it comes to life. It really does. But when you're still an enemy, man, every time you see like the, the sickle being brought into the grapes, you're like, oh no, or the fire, or the smoke of the torment, or the eternal judgment, or, or you know, the, the second death, and you're like, oh my God. Well, you focus on those things and you don't even understand what they are, but you're seeing them as negative towards you. But when you come to the bride, you're seeing that those things are great, they're good, you have to go through them. They suck most times. They really suck. But it's something you have to come through to get to that intimacy, okay? And, you know, I just did a segment of video that I just got rid of because this translation I just read was terrible. And it's uh, it's HS, HCSB, whatever that is. But it's a terrible translation. I can't even stand it. Um, <clears throat> it's kind of like a paraphrased Bible. So I want to move on to <clears throat> um, the Geneva Bible, which is kind of fun. It's it's a it's a book that kind of predated the the uh, King James Bible. It was the it was a Bible that had like everybody's commentaries in it. Like all like the all the um, reformers were, were gathered in Geneva. And this is the only place they weren't being persecuted. So they had to come and um, they came together and they kind of translated the Bible. And then they added all these notes in here, which led to a big uprising. And so the and King James, you know, what he did is he, he said, okay, well, you guys can have the Bible. Just take the notes out. Because people were trying to, you know, they were seeing how the king wasn't, um, he, there was no such thing as divine right of kings. There was all this other stuff. Well, he was like, nope, if you pull out the notes and then he gave, then so the King James Bible is really the Geneva Bible, but with all the notes taken out. Okay. So anyway, let's, let's begin right here in, in Revelation 1. And 1-1, uh, and we'll just kind of work our way through the chapter and, and just see what, what Christ has done. Okay. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him, to show unto his servants the things which must shortly be done, which he sent and showed by his angel unto his servant John, who bear record of the word of God and of the testimony of Jesus Christ and of all things that he saw. Blessed is he that reads and they that hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written therein for the time is at hand. See, blessed is he that reads. And they that hear the words of this prophecy. So blessed are those that read, and blessed are those that hear. Okay, this this is his this is his whole goal. It's not warning you of fear. He's trying to bless you. Okay. But it's all counterintuitive, and he's not pointing that out. It, this is like something that you have to. I don't know. As you develop and grow. You know, John's kind of, I mean, he's aware of all the pitfalls, I'm sure, of being a Christian and developing and learning and the doubts and all these other things that you have. Anyway, the book of Revelation seems like it's uh, a very, uh, you know, like it's written in code, you know, it's, it's, but it's really not. It's, it's John's bringing the life to things of the Old Testament. So, um, John to the seven churches, which are in Asia, Grace be with you, and peace from him which is, which was, and which is to come. So grace be with you and peace. He's not here to, he's not trying to scare you. And it says which, so then it says from him which is, and which was, and which is to come, and from the seven spirits which are before his throne. And from Jesus Christ, 
which is that faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead and the prince of the kings of the earth unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his blood. Okay, this is so far all I see is this good news. I see this, this starting out and everything all going to the glory of Jesus. <clears throat> the prince of the kings of the earth. You know who the kings of the earth are, right? It'll say here in a second. He says um, in 6, five, you know, 1 6, and he made us kings and priests unto God, even the Father to him. I say, be glory and dominion forevermore. Amen. So, <clears throat> so this glory and dominion. So it says, first of all, he made us kings and priests. Well, that's really, really important because. Um, that's the image and dominion of God, a king and a priest. So the priest is the one that shows his image. The, the king is the one that exerts his dominion. And so Christ is the original priest king. He's the first priest king and the first begotten of the dead. If he's the first begotten of the dead, you're the next begotten of the dead. Right? Us, we are. Because of him. But the thing is, is now because we rose from the dead with him, we are made again in his image. So Adam and Eve were made in the image and dominion of God. It says straight up in Genesis. The image and dominion of God. But what happened was is that they, whenever they ate of the apple, they conceived of their own images and they, they conformed to their image and then separated themselves from the image of God. So they no longer had the image and dominion of God. And everyone's like, oh, well, oh, man's made in the image of God. Well, true. We were made in the image of God, but we forfeit it daily for our own images and our own understanding of what we think righteousness is. Okay? So Christ has loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood, but for the purpose that you would lay down your own righteousness that was because of your sense of falling short. But you've been made a, pr a priest and king, so you're in the image and dominion of God because Christ is the image and dominion of God. Okay. Um, it says, Behold, he comes with the clouds, and every eye shall see him, even they which pierced him through, and all kindreds of the earth shall wail before him, even so. Amen. Okay, let's break this down. Behold, he comes with the clouds. Um, and there's a lot of stuff going on in this, but really, mainly, you got to go back to looking at the altar of incense and see what's going on because in Revelation 8 I believe or 6 one of the two it talks about the incense the incense being the prayers of the saints but the incense doesn't raise unless there's fire but anyway that's for another time but those clouds represent us and that's where God's Shekinah glory showed inside that cloud of incense inside of the Holy of Holies on the Day of Atonement whenever whenever he would go in and spread the blood uh, over the mercy seat, God would actually appear. Well, that's appearing in us, and we are that cloud. I mean, we go to Hebrews, the end of Hebrews, and it says um, that he's so happy to be to see he's surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses. Um, so he comes with the clouds, and every eye shall see him, yes, even they which pierced him. Well, that's that's really awesome because that shows that they're not dead, they're not destroyed, that when every eye will see him means that those people aren't dead. They're just, they're just waiting for judgment, for Christ to, to uh, you say that, redeem all of the purchased possession. Okay, they're waiting on that redemption because we've already got the purchase that's already been done. Now we're just waiting on the redemption. Whenever God comes and takes up his home, and whenever he comes and reigns. So it's just a matter of time. Okay. Now, um, it says, All the kindreds of the earth shall wail before him. Even so, amen. Well, you know, <clears throat> and everybody gets all cryptic with this, but in my experience, I wailed when I found out that I had been denying the, the Christ to my own detriment, what I was teaching others to, I wailed. So I, I really think this has a lot to do with your being, when, when you're released from the deception, when you see how much Christ loved us and how we murdered him for nothing, 
that he did nothing wrong. We did it to cover our own sins and our own tracks. I mean, subconsciously, of course, for most of us. But if Jesus came to the earth right now, he'd piss us off. Because we would be, I mean, nothing like him. I mean, honestly. So he says, <clears throat> I'm the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the ending, says the Lord, which is, which was, and which is to come, even the Almighty. Now, the beginning and the ending, it's really interesting because, because nothing was created that was not created through Christ. So Christ is the beginning. Jesus is the beginning. And, the, and it says that he is also the end. So everything is going to be, everything has to be bound up in him. It, and it's, it's really interesting because if, if we were built and, and made in grace, what are we going to die in? Or what are we going to be resurrected in? It's always him. You guys you got to see that um, if he's the beginning and the end, um, think about it with us. At the beginning, we were made in the image and dominion of God, which we were made in the image of Christ. In the end of all things, what's Christ going to have back? He was meant to be expressed through us corporately. Christ is. That each one of us, bearing witness with him, manifests him. But not like I'm a little Jesus running around. I mean, I, I guess I could be kind of, because it says, as he is, so are we in this world. But that's not the intention. And even if I was, it's Christ is desires to be expressed in the entire body. So that each one of us is like a, an appendage or a cell of his body. And we all move together. And we're all, we all move with the spirit. And we all work together. We all, we are all, it's like we're all pushing the same direction. We're all working to, to establish his kingdom instead of, all of our different kingdoms all scattered in different ways. I just, it would be really amazing for me to see everybody in unison, you know, and see what would God would create. It, it kind of reminds me of those bands, you know, like the marching bands that you see them go out on the field and they all, they are all so perfectly choreographed and they're all submitted to the will of, of their conductor. And uh, they, 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 and all of a sudden you don't see what they're doing. All of a sudden they become all these different shapes and sizes, and they're saying words and pictures, and they're it's like wow, these people are all they're all submitted. Well, <clears throat> once we have all laid down our own self righteousness and our own ideas of what good and evil are, <clears throat> and we go about and we all put our faith in Christ, and we don't have anything left to do anymore for ourselves when everything is done on our behalf. What, I wonder what the Lord could do with us if we weren't if we weren't trying to serve our own interests all the time. It'd be pretty cool. And, and we really don't need to serve our own interests because God says he'll provide if we seek first his kingdom. I know it's hard to do. I mean, we struggle with it. My wife and I worry about finances. We worry about things. It's really a struggle for us to just say, all right, God will provide, <laughs> you know, in all aspects of your life so that we're free to do stuff like this. We're, we're free to go to Bible studies and lead and teach the, the gospel and to, you know, the stuff that we, we do all the time, it's because we don't have any concern for ourselves anymore. We don't care. Christ is finished and I'm done and done. I don't have any worries about me. I don't care. You know, so it allows me, and frees me up to read the scriptures and enjoy life and to be a present father and to, to go out and preach the gospel continually because I don't care about me anymore. I'm done and I'm looking to you and I want you to get to that place to where you're done too, where there's nothing, there's nothing that can separate you from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. Nothing ever, ever. You are the bride, not an enemy. Okay. And it says, I, John, even your brother and companion in tribulation and in the kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ was in the aisle called Patmos for the word of God and for the witnessing of Jesus Christ. Hmm. Your brother and companion in tribulation and the kingdom and patience of Jesus. So 
you know, and, and so much to me, this looks like the Red Sea, to where we, we, we're going through life and persecution. People think we're nuts. Our families think we're nuts. We're, we're like, you know, everybody just thinks we're just like these, we're off our rockers and we think, you know, it's like we believe in this invisible God and you guys are just, you know, this old archaic thinking and blah, 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 blah. <clears throat> but we're, we take it, we bear it. We're just like, yeah, well, I'm sorry. We, we look at them like little kids. Seeing these poor lost little children, instead of being offended, we're like, uh, you know, and it's like, so on the same, we're sharers in tribulations together, persecutions, you know, insecurities, you know, just dangers on here and left and right. But it's like the Red Sea, whenever the, the Israelites went through an ocean and water represents condemnation and damnation. And they walked right through the middle of it all on dry land. And that's kind of like a picture for us. You know, because in the desert, they walked through, in the heat of the day, God was a cloud that covered them, gave them shade. And at night when it was cold, God was a pillar of fire that gave them heat. So like the, it's like they, while well, the rest of the world were, no one could walk through that area and survive. Yet they were walking through comfortably, being fed every day, water is provided for them. They, they you know, it's like, what? And that's kind of like how we walk in the Lord. So we share with each other that we acknowledge the dangers, we acknowledge all these things, but we're also patient. We're sharing in the patience together to where we're walking through all this stuff and looking at it, but it's really not touching us. I mean, I'm a witness of that. I look at everything falling down outside of us, and but my wife and I are just like, do, 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 trolling along in Jesus. I think that's really maddening to people. You know, religious and non-religious alike is that whenever you're not concerned with the things there are, yet things just keep working out. Isn't it crazy? <laughs> I mean, I should have failed 9,000 times. I really don't put any diligence to my life. I really just kind of just put myself in the Lord and walk in a dream with him. And I just kind of like walk around going, you know, studying and thinking about him all day long. And, uh, you know, my wife, she, she does a really great job of taking up the slack too, but we are way blessed beyond what my means are. You know, it's just honestly, <laughs> let's share together in his kingdom and his patience because the kingdom is not with outward observation. The kingdom is within you. Okay to where you have peace when everybody else is afraid. <clears throat> and I was ravished in the spirit on the Lord's day. I love this translation right here. I was ravished. And that's really cool. It's just when you're just, I've been ravished several times. We're just, you're just blown away by the greatness of God. And I heard behind me a great voice as it had been of a trumpet saying, I'm the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, and that which, which you see right in a book. And send it to the seven churches which are in Asia, unto Ephesus, and to Smyrna, and to Pergamos, and to Thyatira, and to Sardis, and unto Philadelphia, and unto Laodicea. Then I turned back to see the voice that spake with me. When I was turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks. And in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like the Son of Man, clothed with a, with a garment down to, this, to his feet and girded about with paps with a golden girdle. And this is great because the seven lamps are the churches. So he turns around and he sees the churches. But there's one clothed like the Son of Man. <laughs> well, I, I, that's the body of Christ. Uh, it's, that's the body. And if you look at how the lampstand was built, um, you, and see as one piece of gold and it was beaten into shape and what it contained with the knops and the flowers and the seeds and all this stuff you guys should check it out or get with me and we'll talk about it mm -hmm. but it's really being that there's seven golden lampstands so christ being the first christ is the lampstand talks about how he was beaten into shape and it made this lampstand well then there's the seven which is the number of completeness and it's the churches and he turns around and he hears this voice he turns around and he sees the churches but then he sees the one clothed like the son of man um, but that's, that's the body of Christ, you know, cause the, the voice of many waters, um, that's like a, a crowd speaking to me. Anyway, it says in the midst of the, uh, uh, and the golden girdle and everything, his head and his hairs were white like wool and snow and his eyes were like a flame of fire and his feet like in defiant brass burning as in a furnace and the voice of many waters, there it is. 
And he had in his right hand the seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his face shone as the sun shines in his strength. And see, this is when Moses was in the presence of God. It's the, you know, and the sharp double-edged sword is the gospel. And it, it's like, it's the body wielding these things. This is what John saw. This isn't Christ in a singularity, it's the corporate Christ being the body. Um, and so, so it says down here, whenever it says that the golden, the, there's a girdle about the paps, the golden girdle. See, whenever there's a girdle about the loins, it's talking about the works. That's when you put it on for works. But when it's the when it's over the breast, it's a matter of the heart. You know, and this is just great. There's so much going on here, and I wish I had more time. Um. Anyway, da, 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 da. and his face shone as the sun that shines in his strength, and and we see that in Moses whenever he was up on the mountain with God, and communing with Him. And that's us. When we commune with Christ, we manifest him. Because we, it's like once we know him and we see him, it's like he just emanates from you. It says straight out, though, as you, the more you know him, the more like him you become. Anyway, and when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. And he laid his right hand upon me, saying unto me, Fear not, I am the first and the last. And I am alive, but I was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And I have the keys of hell and death. Write these things which you have seen, and the things which are, and which things shall come hereafter. The mystery of the seven stars which you have saw in my right hand, and the seven golden candlesticks is this. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven candlesticks which you saw are the seven churches. Um, and I like this part here. It says, I have the keys of hell and death. So what do you think he's doing with those keys? Anyway, that's for another topic, um, another day. But anyways, brethren, be blessed. The Lord is yours and you're his. He came for this purpose so that you could have life with him, that you can enjoy, that you can be free from the fears of the world, that you can walk with the first fruits of heaven. Right now, where we, where we look and we see the waters of condemnation, we see the drought, we see all these things, we see these enemies, we see them all around, but we still walk and with God as our rear reward. He's, the, he's our protection all the time. He's always here protecting us. And then there are bad things that happen to us, that's true, but not nearly what we deserve. And, and those things are gonna come regardless of whether or not you worry about them. So rather, spend your time focusing on Jesus, magnifying him. Don't look at yourself. Because if you look at yourself, you'll never see how you can be saved. But if you look at him, you can sit, never think about how you aren't saved. You can never see how you're, you're not because of his great love or with he loved you and washed you in his own blood. All right, my brothers and sisters, you guys have a wonderful day. Take to mind, take to heart what I've said and rejoice because Christ is risen. He is the first and the last, the Alpha and the Omega, and you are in him. All right, you guys, love you. Have a great day.